Welcome to the Oxygenation, Ventilation, and Perfusion Lecture for this week. These are the objectives that we will be covering in this lecture. Use this as your guide to study for this in particular concept and concepts we will be covering this week. As a learning outline, we will review pulmonary function, ventilation and perfusion, which is VQ, acute respiratory failure, acute lung injury, or ALI, and acute respiratory distress syndrome, better known as ARDS, and also pulmonary embolisms, PEs. Let's first discuss and give a brief overview of pulmonary function. You can see in this photo, this is a lobule of the lung. So pathophysiology, we know that gas exchange occurs in the alve alveoli themselves. Macrophages move from alveoli to alveoli and they clear out foreign substances and they keep uh, alveoli sterile. There are two different types of alveolar cells, however, there's type one, which are flat, they're squamous epithelial cells. Do you guys remember that from microbiology? Hopefully so. And these um, contribute to the largest um, type of alveolar cells. They make up approximately 90% of alveolar surface and work with the gas exchange itself. Type two alveolar cells, they secrete pulmonary surfactant and decrease surface tension. So this allows the alveoli to um, remain open, prevents collapse um, of the smaller airways during expiration. Um, in pulmonary circulation from the pulmonary arteries, um, gas exchange occurs. We have bronchial circulation, which is from the aorta and internal mammary, the subclavian and intercostal arteries. And this um, has the blood supply to the airways itself. So this is figure 1401 from your book, um, Introduction to Critical Care by Soul. And you can see this is an image of ventilation and perfusion. And it's basically showing you um, pulmonary causes of hypoxemia. So in image A here, that's normal. So that's normal alveolar capillary um, unit. And you can see the pulmonary vein, pulmonary capillary, and then the pulmonary artery, and then the alveolus. You can also see oxygen um, there as well. Now B, you see here, this is actually showing hypoventilation. Um, and hypoventilation causes an increase in the PaCO2 and decreased P PaO2. So um, in regards to the C image, it shows um, blood that is shunting. So blood passes by a um, blocked alveolus um, and gas exchange cannot occur. And you can see that how it's kind of collapsed there. Um, image D is ventilation perfusion mismatch resulting many times from, as you can see there, a blood clot uh, or a pulmonary embolus. And image E is where a diffusion um, defect is occurring due to increased um, interstitial fluid. So the, the picture, or the figures I should say, um, depict um, normal and then mismatches that occur commonly in the critical care settings. Um, there can also be an imbalance between ventilation, perfusion, or both. Here you'll see um, an ABG values, and you can use these as a review and also a guide. Uh, you can review ABG interpretation in your book, and you should be able to determine whether an ABG is respiratory versus metabolic, and whether it's acidotic or alkalotic. Um, you should also be able to determine what interventions are needed to correct such imbalances as well. You'll also be reviewing and practicing ABG interpretation in your um, clinical sites during post-conference as well.
the image here is of airways. Um, we'll discuss airways and then obviously oxygen delivery at the same time. So there are many types of airways as well as oxygen delivery methods. Um, you may see while you're in the clinical care settings this semester. You, some of you may have more experience than others, especially um, if you've ever um, administered um, oxygen to a patient or had to begin um, oxygen therapy on a patient. Um, most of you should be familiar with a nasal cannula um, or at least an O2 mask, a face mask. Other types of oxygen delivery devices you may see in the critical care setting um, may include a non rebreather mask, a tracheostomy, and an endotracheal tube, also known as an ET tube. You can see the image in this slide shows both a tracheostomy as well as an ET tube. You'll need to know the different types of oxygen delivery devices and when a patient uh, may have one versus um, another. We often you know, don't think of consequences for applying oxygen. Um, we think of it as a you know, nursing intervention um, that we may give if we notice that the SpO2 is a little um, decreased um, while patients are in the clinical setting. However, complications can and may occur from um, too much oxygen use. So one complication is that of oxygen toxicity, um, and that may occur if high doses of oxygen is applied or delivered to the patient for a prolonged period of time. So it's kind of twofold. You're looking at um, how high of um, like FiO2 you're delivering to the patient as well, which is inspired fractionated oxygen. Um, and you're also looking at the period of time that you are um, administering or delivering the oxygen to the patient, which can lead to the oxygen toxicity. Additional complications um, can, also co can also occur um, with high doses of oxygen being delivered, um, especially with those with uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD. So a high dose of O2 can knock out their drive to take a, a breath, um, potentially leading to respiratory failure and even respiratory um, arrest. One um, night in particular, I was working and I was the um, rapid response nurse. And the rapid response nurse, as you know, goes around to all the floors and says, hi, my name is, and you give them your name and you give them the, the pager number and the phone number um, that they can reach you at. I got a page one night and and I had to go down to one of the floors and um, it was a patient who was in respiratory distress and I asked a little bit of information about his background, um, you know, just to try and get acquainted with him. He had COPD and they had him on um, a face mask at like 10 liters of oxygen. So um, he immediately um, needed to be intubated and um, and so I had to call basically a code for him because he his drive had already been knocked out um, and he was not breathing um, appropriately. So in addition, you know, just for you to be aware of, um, you know, we always want to make sure of patient's history um, when we're getting report and when we're also delivering care to them. And this will help you know, minimize, um, you know, code situations as well as, you know, potential respiratory or, excuse me, um, rapid responses to those areas. But again, that's what rapid response is for. So you would naturally call them if you were on a med surge unit and then the rapid response nurse would um, come accordingly. So in regards to, moving on, in regards to um, suctioning, many of you have performed suctioning on a patient um, during your med surge rotations, I'm sure. Um, but many times you'll probably have just used a suction catheter, whether it's even a yonker um, or an actual catheter where you've had to go through the nose, down um, through the oral cavity and get some secretions from the back of the um, uh, throat area. So there are oral pharyngeal and also nasopharyngeal suctioning. Um, which is known as open suctioning or one-time use suctioning, right? 
Um, if a patient is intubated, however, there are also um, different types of sectioning that you may use. You may use the Yonkauer. However, you may also use um, subglottic sectioning um, as well as closed or inline sectioning. And when you are in the ICU settings, you'll see that these uh, closed um, or inline sectioning units, um, there should not be any break in the um, suction tubing itself. Um, so you should not be disconnecting and then like connecting a Yonkauer to the closed sectioning and trying to suction orally that the Yonkauer should have its own suction container um, so that not to break, you know, sterility because you, that inline sectioning, um, you know, you're going, um, you're going deep and, and performing deep suctioning on these patients um, through the ET tube itself. So you don't want to cause VAP or any other type of um, potential bacterial infection from occurring as well. Um, subglottic suctioning um, is attached to the ET tube itself um, and is connected separately again to its own suctioning device apart from the ET tube um, closed suctioning system. And studies have shown um, in the American Journal of Critical Care um, they found that there are differences in practice as well as policies for like subglottic, oral, and ET tube suctioning. Um, and it was at first, it appeared that subglottic um, suctioning where the um, secretions would kind of pool on the back of the throat um, would help prevent VAP. However, um, it was found that um, it's it was not found to be cost-effective in reducing the incidence of VAP from occurring, though. And every um, healthcare institution, you know, has different policies and procedures in regards to scheduled oral care um, that, you know, can be given at predetermined times. A lot of times it's, you know, Q4 hours in the ICU setting. And they may have it for 8, 12, and 4 p.m. or 8, 12, and um, Four, yeah, 4 p.m. Or if you're coming on night shift, 8 p.m., obviously midnight and 4 a.m. Um, but every place is a little bit different, so the times may differ. And this is usually on like your nursing interventions and um, tasks that you have to complete um, during a certain period of time throughout your shift. And often you'll see um, chlorhexidine is used for oral care, especially in patients who are mechanically ventilated. However, for patients who have like a tracheostomy, you should, um, you may also see oral care to be administered with like oral swabs because their mouths do get very dry. Um, both patient populations require teeth brushing at least once a shift. And so you will, um, you will see these interventions based on the policy itself. So it goes without saying but I will give a gentle reminder here that you will need to know the different modes of ventilation as well as strategies for preventing VAP, which I had mentioned um, briefly in week, uh, in week one's lecture. Um, so some common modes of ventilation um, include AC, which um, tidal volume is delivered at a set rate in response to a patient's effort. So if the patient fails to breathe at a predetermined time, the ventilator will deliver a breath at um, and also a set tidal volume to the patient. Um, SIMV, which is synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation, it's where uh, tidal volume is delivered at a low set rate um, in response to uh, a patient's effort, but also allows them to spontaneously breathe between the set rate. So when the patient takes a breath on their own, they have to pull their own tidal volume, which helps the patients regain, um, you know, respiratory muscle strength. And this is like one step, you know, towards hopefully, you know, extubating the patient. But again, they have to have that muscle strength. And they may be on that um, for only a, a period of time. And if they start to struggle, they may switch them back to the AC mode. Um, there's also CPAP, which applies positive pressure um, it's continuous positive airway pressure um, during spontaneous um, breaths. And that really helps to keep the alveo alveoli open. Um, you may see that um, some patients who have, um, you know, sleep apnea, they may have um, 
uh, home CPAP machines themselves, um, and that is to help um, with their sleep apnea. But you'll also see that as a mode of um, ventilation on a ventilator, and typically we see the CPAP um, orders for CPAP may occur where a provider states, okay, we'll have a CPAP trial. We're going to see how well the patient is breathing on their own. Um, and they may try it, you know, for the first time for maybe a couple of hours. And if the patient begins to struggle, then they'll um, switch them back to whatever mode of ventilation they were previous previously on. If um, they're doing well, then they may um, extubate. But typically, um, you know, patients are... Um, are put on the CPAP trial before they're extubated. There's also pressure support uh, ventilation, which offers help to the patient to overcome uh, the small diameter and length of the ET tube itself because it's like you're breathing through a straw. The pressure um, control ventilation uses a set pressure instead of a tidal volume. So the ventilator delivers um, gas until a certain predetermined pressure limit is reached. And that mode um, can be used in um, acute lung injury to prevent um, barotrauma. There's also um, another mode of uh, mechanical ventilation, which is called high frequency oscillation. And this delivers very small tidal volumes, typically one to two uh, milliliters per kilogram at rates up to like 420 um, breaths per minute. So um, this may be used in um, and seen more typically in ARDS patients or acute respiratory distress um, patients. We also want to make sure that, um, you know, with patients who are uh, mechanically ventilated, we want to implement and make sure that um, we are intervening um, strategies to prevent um, ventilator acquired or associated uh, pneumonia from occurring. And again, there are VAP protocols, um, policies, and procedures that are in um, different ICUs. Um, and so you can pull those um, policies and procedures up um, via the computer, or they may have a book. It may be printed somewhere. And so those are the types of things, um, interventions that they've included in like those VAP bundles that you may um, hear about. So let's talk a little bit about acute respiratory failure. So acute respiratory failure is really um, you're in a state or the patient is in a state of altered gas exchange with failure of either oxygenation, ventilation, um, or both. It is manifested in altered ABGs um, that you may see, and in acute respiratory failure, um, which is a major cause of morbidity and mortality in um, critical care areas, it's important to recognize not only signs and symptoms of acute respiratory failure, but also potential causes and interventions to manage it as well. So again, we want to know what the causes are for acute respiratory failure. So oxygen, uh, you know, decreases can result from a variety of factors, um, from anywhere from hypoventilation, drug overdose, neurological disorders, neuromuscular disorders, abdominal or thoracic surgery, um, intrapulmonary shunting, which occurs again when the blood is shunted away from the lungs, um, pneumonia, pulmonary edema. These are some common um, causes of uh, shunting in adults. Um, and as a reminder, additional O2 will not be affected if um, blood is being shunted, right? Um, because it's being shunted elsewhere, so it's not oxygenating, even if you give higher doses of O2. Um, additional causes can be the ventilation perfusion, perfusion mismatch, um, often seen like in PEs, um, diffusion defects, um, low cardiac output, low hemoglobin levels, and um, tissue hypoxia. So I've broken up um, by systems as well as um, different types of tissue um, of the organ um, so that you can see 
um, some causes. So you can see it says parenchyma, cardiovascular, ex, um, extra pulmonary. So that means um, occurring outside the lungs, right? Um, examples of that are like a pneumothorax or a pleural effusion. Pneumothorax can be caused by trauma or from lung diseases or surgeries. And pleural effusions can occur due to um, causes such as uh, congestive heart failure, um, illnesses or diseases like um, TB or pneumonia, and even lung cancer, right? And then uh, peripheral neural or spinal cord um, causes um, ALS, or also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Remember, that's a um, nervous system disease that progressively weakens muscles and impacts their function. Guillain-Barre is a progressive paralysis that occurs uh, peripherally and then um, um, rises, right, uh, superiorly. The muscle weakness um, and eventual paralysis of the lung tissue requires use of a mechanical ventilator. And most patients will regain their respiratory drive and ability to breathe on their own, but it may take years for this to occur. So truly, um, you know, hypoxemia um, as a result from acute respiratory failure um, impacts every organ and um, tissue, right? So... Um, anaerobic metabolism um, can occur with hypoxemia. So this is when the PaO2 is less than 55 millimeters of mercury. This is considered uh, severe hypoxemia. This causes patients to become acidotic. The tissues are basically starving and not able to oxygenate, which affects all tissues and organs of the body. You should also know the values of PaO2, which is 80 to 100 percent, and PaCO2, which is approximately 35 to 45. Um, also severe hypercapnia is considered 50 millimeters of mercury or, or greater. Remember PaO2 is the uh, partial pressure of oxygen that's dissolved in arterial blood and PaCO2 is partial pressure of the amount of CO2 or carbon dioxide dissolved in arterial blood. You may see um, different values in your clinical setting. Um, they often do vary by a few numbers, plus or minus one or two. But every healthcare institution has, you know, predefined laboratory values, right? And you most of the time see those in the lab section, in the EMRs or electronic health record. So acute hypoxic respiratory failure may be caused from an oxygenation deficit or an inability to achieve adequate oxygenation. And acute hypercapnic respiratory failure may cause, may be caused from a uh, ventilation deficit or defect, uh, inadequate alveolar ventilation, increased PaCO2 with a preserved PaO2 level, or you may have a patient that has combined hypoxemia and hypercapnic respiratory failure. Remember how your lab values um, you know, you'll need to know your, your normal lab values. So uh, normal ventilation is four liters per minute, um, which is the V, right? Um, and then normal perfusion is five liters per minute, which is the Q. So that's the v, VQ ratio. So it's four over five. And if you divide that, it's 0 0.8. Um, and that should be a normal level. So you may uh, also remember a common cause for a VQ mismatch occurs with uh, PEs. So this may be one reason a VQ scan is done. However, it's not definitive to diagnose a PE and we'll talk about PEs a little bit later. So truly what you need to do um, is treat the cause. You need to figure out why acute respiratory failure is occurring and then treat the cause. So in managing acute respiratory failure, um, you know, again, it's going to differ based on a patient's clinical condition. I know everyone would like the same management algorithm for every patient who may be suffering from acute respiratory failure. However, it truly depends on each individual patient's clinical condition and how they're presenting. So we always start with obviously the least invasive first. So if someone's having difficulty breathing, we don't always intubate them immediately, right? 
So as you've done previously, you know, on the different med surge floors, you may apply a nasal cannula or a face mask and administer oxygen accordingly, right? So this is still true in the critical care settings. We want to make sure we prevent aspiration, um, and we can do this by, by what? Elevating the head of the bed, turning the patient on their side, depending upon the situation. We can also perform pulmonary to toileting and uh, suctioning. Again, we want to treat the cause, which may include improving and optimizing cardiac output by means of increasing uh, the rate of potentially a uh, temporary pacemaker or administering IV inotropes or chronotropes or correcting anemia by administering a unit of um, packed red blood cells. Uh, you also want to keep in mind um, PEEP or positive pressure um, uh, ventilation reduces venous return to the heart. So you'll need to balance PEEP, P-E-E-P, in order to maintain functional cardiac output. A PA catheter or a NICOM uh, may be used. NICOM is a non-invasive cardiac output monitoring system. Um, and most of the time, you'll see them as like FlowTrack or Vigileo, um, which are basically just the brand names of these um, output monitoring systems. And they're accessed through an arterial line um, with monitoring capability um, that you can see on the monitors through a waveform, just like you would a normal um, A-line. So it's measuring the uh, stroke volume or the amount of blood in mLs um, ejected by the left ventricle during one contraction. So a NICOM is least invasive to that of a PA line, and we'll learn more about hemodynamic uh, lines and management in a few short weeks. Um, providers may also use like CPAP or BiPAP as a means to defer or prevent intubation from occurring. I've often, again, seen CPAP used um, readily in the ICU to wean a patient like I I'm discussed previously from a ventilator, but then also as a like a last ditch effort to avoid intubation from occurring. So it basically buys the provider some time. However, research has um, concluded that the use of CPAP um, in those instances um, to prolong, I guess, um, the inevitable, which is intubation, may actually increase mortality rates um, from these. Um, you know, from prolonged uh, use, um, prolonged periods of use before actually intubating the patient. So remember that a CPAP delivers a set pressure throughout inspiration and expiration. Um, it also helps to recruit and open the alveoli and prevent atelectasis from occurring. And so it really keeps those alveolo alveoli open. BiPAP can be set again um, with an inspiratory and expiratory pressure and um, reduces the work of breathing and is more effective than CPAP. However, research has um, not uh, seen a significant difference between their uses, between the CPAP and the BiPAP. Provider may order initially um, the settings for uh, ventilation for the mechanical ventilation and typically ABGs are um, are completed within 30 minutes of um, you know initial intubation uh, you will still want to correct any imbalances and make adjustments based on the results from those ABGs and also correct fluid and electrolyte imbalances if they're contributing to the acute respiratory failure again we want to treat the cause Additionally, nutritional support should be considered with those suffering from acute respiratory failure. This may include the use of enteral or parenteral nutrition, um, and typically high lipid formulas are commonly ordered versus those of high carbohydrate content. And why would we? Why would we? Um, why would that order be appropriate? High carbohydrate content actually limits uh, carbon dioxide production. So you will see several types of different enteral um, tube formulas on your different units. And when you're in the clinical setting, look to see um, what the differences are and why one is ordered over another. Um, uh, renal failure patients will receive a different one than diabetic patients um, and so on and so forth. 
Um, also ask the nurses why your patients are receiving a certain type of formula. Don't be afraid to ask questions. You'll see commonly um, these types of formulas. They're usually stocked on the floors, you know, for convenience for the nurses to grab. And um, when the um, when the um, formula, you know, is about to run out and they need to prime another line. Um, however, as an advocate for your patient, it's essential for you to know the differences between the formulas and why they're ordered for your patients, right? Again, periodic assessment can be cleaned can be completed through the use of ABGs, O2 saturation, as well as assessing the need for continued uh, mechanical ventilation. Let's discuss ALL, ALI, excuse me, um, acute lung injury and ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So ALI occurs um, due to hypoxia or a hypoxic lung injury resulting in diffuse alveolar damage. Uh, ALI, if left untreated, may lead to acute respiratory distress syndrome. So we want to make sure that we're catching um, if a patient is having a, an acute injury um, resulting in ALI. Um, we want to make sure that we are vigilant in our assessments and also in the interventions and our communication with the physicians or providers um, in order to stave off uh, ARDS from occurring. So both ALI and ARDS um, can occur due to either direct or indirect injuries. Direct injuries may include chest trauma, pneumonia, PEs, radiation, SARS, which is severe acute respiratory syndrome. Um, indirect injuries may be caused by sepsis or burns, severe trauma uh, with multiple blood transfusions, or intracranial hypertension. Patients may present you know, with many symptoms like dyspnea or tachypnea, hyperventilation with normal breath sounds, respiratory alkalosis because they have the tachypnea, right? increased temperature and pulse. Um, you may also see worsening uh, chest x-rays that progress to um, what we like to call a whiteout. Um, increased positive inspiratory pressure on the ventilator and eventual severe hypoxemia. So again, monitoring the ABGs and serial uh, chest x-rays as well as uh, trending PaO2 and FiO2 uh, ratios um, will help you determine whether or not your interventions are working um, and the patient's clinical condition. Here I have um, taken the figure 14.2 out of, again, the Introduction to Critical Care uh, Soul book um, that you're reading. And you can see um, this is uh, Pathophysiology of ARDS. So in ARDS, there's an insult causing a systemic inflammatory response syndrome to occur, or SIRS, right? And there is a, a release of these inflammatory uh, mediators causing damage to the alveolar capillary membrane, which increases their permeability, causing pulmonary edema. And this is uh, from a non, obviously a non-cardiogenic um, reason. So this in turn causes microatelectasis, which leads to a decreased compliance or stiffness of the lungs. And there's also um, decreased surfactant. Um, remember the type 2 um, types of uh, alveoli, remember, and um, cells. So this leads to impaired gas exchange and obviously a ventilation and perfusion mismatch or a VQ mismatch. So there's, you know, several diagnostic criteria um, that can be taken into consideration for patients who have ALI or ARDS. Um, there's not one uh, test where you say, okay, well, I, I did an ABG, so I know this patient has ARDS, or I did a chest x-ray, and I know this patient has ALI, right? So there's not like one test um, that tells us, okay, one versus the other. Um, 
right? So it's a combination of diagnostic, diagnostic criteria. So um, obviously it's acute and onset. Um, pulmonary occlusion, uh, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure or PA wedge pressures measure um, indirectly the pressure of the left atrium. And so the PAOP, which is again the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure or the PCWP, which you will see on exams, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, diagnoses basically the severity of the left ventricle failure, mitral valve stenosis and regurgitation, and aortic stenosis and regurgitation. And then also uh, pulmonary edema uh, may be evident with pressures greater than 18 millimeters of mercury. So in, in looking at ALI um, versus ARDS patients, um, the symptoms may coincide um, immediately with their presentation. You may notice a key way to determine ALI from ARDS um, is based on that uh, PaO2 and FiO2 ratio, and it's in, it is an, an important assessment for you to um, you know calculate. And um, you'll see in ALI the ratio is um, 300 millimeters of mercury or greater, and whereas in ARDS it's um, 200 millimeters of mercury. So again, how do we treat these patients? How will we treat them? You will treat the cause, right? So this is very important. Quite often, ARDS treatment is guided by um, protocols or algorithms. You may see in the ICUs um, with their management focusing on maximizing oxygenation. And you can see that here um, in this slide. Patients with ARDS also may be anxious, um, rightfully so, because they can't breathe, right? And uh, comfort is always an important intervention. Um, you don't want to overlook this in managing them. The use of sedation and narcotics may help to promote comfort in these patients while also decreasing their metabolic demands simultaneously. There may also be times when paralytics may be necessary to ensure uh, synchronization with the ventilator. While the treatment is important, we also want to make sure that we do not cause additional stress, such as barotrauma, um, or fluid electrolyte imbalances, or even skin breakdown. Let's talk a little bit now about uh, PEs, pulmonary embolisms. So most of you know what a pulmonary embolism is. However, it's the migration of a thrombus that breaks loose, right, and travels to the pulmonary arteries, obstructing um, the pulmonary vasculature, right? Uh, an, embo an embolus results in a lack of perfusion to ventilated alveoli. Again, that, that's that VQ mismatch. A PE can also be caused by um, a DVT, atrial fibrillation, and even upper extremity thrombi um, that may occur from uh, PICC lines, right? So the pathophysiology of a PE um, is that of Virchow's triad. So there are three things that can increase the risk of uh, venous thrombus, um, and they are venous stasis, hypercoagulability, and vein wall damage, known as, again, the Virchow's triad. So we know uh, venous return is, is facilitated by the muscular movement of our lower extremities, right, during activity. This is why SCDs are important and that they help simulate activity in patients' uh, lower extremities when they are bedridden. So it makes um, no difference when you walk into the room and you see the SCDs are draped over the bed, right, at the end of the bed. They have to actually be on the patient to make a difference. Um, venous stasis occurs when patients are immobile, which a lot of them are in ICU for a variety of reasons. Um, also, if they have heart failure, um, patients, um, if they're dehydrated or even um, have uh, varicose veins. So there are over um, 100 different mutations that have been detected in genes that code um, for each of the natural like anticoagulant proteins like protein C or protein S and even antithrombin. 
So protein S deficiencies have an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance, and studies have suggested that, um, however, the protein C deficiency is autosomal recessive disorders. And so a lot of times when patients come in and, and they say they have like a blood disorder or uh, a blood disease, you really want to know um, what exactly that, you know, blood disorder is. Um, if, if they have a tendency for high, hypercoagulability, um, even like factor five deficiencies as well. Um, and, and also in uh, cancer patients. So vein wall damage with injury occurs um, in the endothelium resulting in thrombogenesis, um, which is the most significant. PEs um, also create both um, pulmonary and cardiovascular alterations. And um, really, the severity of a PE depends upon the size of the emboli itself and the degree of obstruction occurring. So typically less than 20% obstruction and no like pre-existing pulmonary disease. Um, basically the compensatory mechanisms of, you know, their body will um, minimize the effects, you know, the shortness of breath, the tachypnea, um, whatever effects, um, side, um, signs and symptoms they may be having. They may be able to co uh, compensate for those. Um, if the size exceeds 30, um, you know, is large and, um, exceeds 30 to 40% of, uh, obstruction, then there's a modest increase in pulmonary artery, um, pressures, which again, um, you would be able to monitor through, uh, PAOP, which is pulmonary artery occlusion pressure or the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, um, often, um, just called wedge pressure. Um, if, the obstruction um, exceeds 50 to 60%. Um, that's considered a massive PE. It basically overwhelms any compensatory mechanisms that your body um, would be able to um, basically compensate for. Um, and um, you would see signs of um, cardiovascular compromise, such as a decreased cardiac output, um, maybe decreased uh, left ventricular preload, um, and dramatic increase in right atrial pressure. Um, again, that's a CVP pressure. We'll get into what the hemodynamics are um, a little bit later. And then also um, patients with pre-existing pulmonary disease um, that have uh, pulmonary hypertension um, that is disproportionate to the obstruction um, may see compensatory shunting occurring um, unaffected areas of pulmonary uh, arterial circulation may receive uh, the entire cardiac output. It also affects, obviously, um, PEs affect the pulmonary system. So it increases the dead space, uh, an area of lung um, that receives uh, ventilation without perfusion and can cause, obviously, bronchoconstriction. Again, you may see several signs and symptoms in patients with PE, including chest pain that's worse when they take a deep breath or when they're taking uh, a breath on inspiration, um, dyspnea, tachycardia, cough, hemoptysis, wheezing, crackles, um, and you may even see signs and symptoms of a DVT um, that may alert you um, that this possibly could be a PE. Um, you should always suspect a PE with any new worsening dyspnea um, or sustained like hypotension without any other explanation. So in diagnosing a patient with a PE, um, you may see a D-dimer assay ordered, a VQ scan, a duplex ultrasound, a CT angiography, MRI, or a pulmonary angiogram. And pulmonary angiogram is uh, the gold standard for diagnosing a PE. Um, once definitive uh, diagnosis has occurred, anticoagulation um, may be ordered or a thrombolytic um, inotropes to increase the cardiac output and decrease pulmonary uh, hypertension. Uh, the patient may be given supplemental O2. Um, they may be scheduled for an inferior vena cava filter. Um, Many times you'll see um, compression stockings or sequential compression devices, the SCDs, um, 
or they may treat for uh, atrial dysrhythmias, like if the patient has atrial fibrillation. And again, you would treat the cause. So not every patient is treated the same as causes, you know, vary, um, as you can see. Um, and so does the severity of the PE and clinical condition of the patient. Again, we would try and do the least invasive first. Um, but many times if there is a severe um, compromise, if the patient's severely compromised, um, we may have to, um, you know, if they started out ALI and then, you know, went to ARDS, um, for instance, um, same thing with a massive PE, um, we may need to intubate them versus just giving them supplemental kind of oxygen. We may do that while we're gathering the supplies um, for uh, rapid sequence intubation. Um, however, that's just so that we can um, inevitably intubate them um, so that we can ease their uh, work of breathing. You may also see different types of uh, medications for medical management of those with uh, respiratory alterations in the critical care settings. Uh, some medications you may see administered include bronchodilators, um, corticosteroids, sedating medications, and even neuromuscular blockades. Additionally, um, you may also see um, management include oxygen delivery, uh, nutritional support, hemodynamic monitoring, and even um, administration of uh, transfusions, right? So the packed red blood cells. In preparing for next week, which will be week three, I would suggest that you read and review the chapters um, that will be covered for the upcoming exam as well as practice shadow health modules. You can go back in and practice as many times as you wish. I would also suggest you reviewing the objectives. The objectives are based on what the exam questions will look like. This you should use as your study guide um, to help you hone in on specific information that you should know. I would also suggest that you attend the study sessions with Huen. Um, remember, they follow the class from 11 to 12.50 on Tuesdays. As a reminder, the exam will be online and you will be accessing Proctorio for the exam before it will allow you into the exam. The exam will consist of 50 questions, with each question being worth 1.25 points for a total of 62.5 points. This is true of all exams. The exam will be opened at 8 a.m. and you will have one hour to complete it with one minute for all multiple choice, fill in the blank, and matching questions. And you will have two minutes for each medication calculation question. So I wish everyone good luck in their studying, and I look forward to seeing each of you in class. Take care.